Well, good evening. Uh, sorry for the uh, delay startup. You can thank uh, the uh, New York City traffic. Two hours to get here from New York City. And I'm grateful for my uh, guest, um, uh, Larry Mistel, who um, graciously gave up some time this evening to come out and, and talk to you guys uh, about a very innovative new way of looking at the entertainment industry, specifically music for tonight anyway, uh, uh, called Primary Wave. So um, did you want to talk first or do you want to sh play show and tell? Yeah, so <clears throat> I thought to wake you guys up and to make it a little more interesting. I have a video, it's about, a, I think it's about a 10 minute video. I prepared it uh, or I had my, my team prepare it for an investor uh, meeting that we had about three months ago, but it gives you guys a little bit of an idea of the diversity of the music we're involved with. Some new, some old, some I think you guys will recognize, some you may not, but uh, why don't we get started by playing the video and hopefully you guys will enjoy it and then we can uh, give you a little presentation. Wow. So uh, it's yeah, always uh, a little helpful to start with what we own and what we have so you can see a little bit of you know, what the company looks like. That's quite impressive, actually. <laughs> um, fantastic. So let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. So you went to college. I went to college. <laughs> I did go to college. Should, should I, do you want me yeah, to sit, sit down, up yeah, or sit down, or what do you want to do? Yeah, All right. So uh, you went to school where? So you, wanna, you want me to give you like a 30,000 foot overview of? Well, I think it's always interesting students to know how a captain of industry got started, you know, and it's an inspiration yeah. for them that, you know, everyone has a chance to be a mogul like you. So, <laughs> far from it. Um, so I, I, uh, I went to the University of Massachusetts um, in Amherst and I started, I studied uh, business and uh, I, uh, I won't tell you what my first job was out of school. Because if I tell you what my first job was out of school, it'll be very incongruent to being in the music business. Um, but I started at Island Records in, uh, in 1989. I actually met Chris Blackwell um, in 1989. I was helping a company called Polygram Records by Island Records. And uh, I met Chris and- well, uh, well, how did you get into Polygram Records? The boring company that I was working for before the music business, um, I saw, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> you got to promise not to tell anybody, especially my artists. Um, so out of school, I was a business major, and I started, uh, I started working out of school at a company called Arthur Young. Okay, and Arthur Young was an accounting firm. They merged in with Ernst & Winnie to create uh, Ernst & Young, which still exists today. And I was at Ernst & Young for about three years, and um, uh, so I, I had met, in, in, as I said, in 1989, I met, met uh, Chris Blackwell. And I met Chris uh, because I was helping Polygram Records buy his company, Island Records. And um, very, I'll, I'll tell you a very, very funny but true story. Um, and I'll, I'll, I, I know we're, we're late, so I'll, no, please, I'll, uh, please. I'll, I'll quickly roll through this. So, I was working at Arthur Young, and, uh, and I was helping, as I said, Polygram buy uh, this company, this record label, Island Records, and I met a gentleman who was Chris Blackwell's right-hand guy, and his name was Mel Klein. Fantastic guy. And he says to me during this whole process, he says, you know, um, I'm going to be leaving the company after this sale takes place, and I need somebody to take my position. And I think he's teasing me. And he says, you know, I'd, I'd like you to take my position and uh, I'm going to introduce you to Chris Blackwell. So um, Three I years this, out of college. Yes. So, so I had this, I had this, uh, so Mel set up an interview with Chris Blackwell, who's a legend. Right? He started Island Records in 1962. He signed U2. He signed Melissa Etheridge. Bob Marley, uh, Steve Winwood, Robert Palmer, Grace Jones, Bad Company. I mean, a, a legendary music, music guy. And so he sets up 
a meeting for me uh, and, and Chris so that Chris could interview me. <coughs> and, um, and I didn't hear from him for probably two months. So I'm thinking, ah, they weren't interested. And, and I'm in my office one day, sitting at my desk, and the phone rings, and it's Mel Klein. And he says to me, um, I want you to quickly come down and meet Chris today. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at the phone, and I, you know, I haven't heard from you for two months, you want me to come down and meet this guy? So I jumped into a taxi, I went down to Fourth and Broadway, the offices were, you probably, got, you probably don't even remember this, but there was an old Tower Records for those of you that remember Tower Records, it's on, it was on 4th and Broadway, and Island Records offices were on the second floor, the whole second floor above Tower Records. Um, and, uh, you know, legendary space, uh, legendary Tower record store. And um, so I, I show up to the office, I go into Mel Klein's office, and he says, okay, you're gonna do great, you're gonna do great, <laughs> don't screw it up because I really wanna leave as soon as possible. And you know, you're going to take over for me. And I'm thinking this guy is completely out to lunch. So I go in and meet Chris Blackwell. He takes me into his office. And if the interview lasted three minutes, it was a lot. And Chris was a very shy guy. I remember he was wearing a scarf, you know, flip flops, no socks, you know, and he wore that in the winter. And uh, he was Jamaican, so he always walks around in flip flops and a scarf. So, three minute interview. He says, you know, very nice to meet you. I, he may have said a couple of words to me. And he says, very nice to meet you. And I'm, I'm shocked. It's three, I was expecting to sit with him for an hour. So I go into Mel Klein's office. I go into Mel's office and I said, oh my God, it was three minutes. He goes, ah, that's a minute and a half longer than he spends with most people. He said, I'm sure you did great, it's great. I'll call you later and, uh, and I'm sure it'll all work out. So I go back to my office. I don't hear from the guy. This is no joke. I don't hear from the guy for almost three months. The phone rings three months later and it's Mel and he says to me, you're starting on Monday. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean I'm starting on Monday? He goes, you're starting to work on Monday, I'm leaving. But I'll stay with you for four or five days and I'll you know, get you up to speed. And I, I really think, I think the guy's absolutely crazy. Okay? And um, so he says, be in the office on Monday, you're starting. I said, well, don't have to give, you know, my place of business, don't have to give Arthur Young two weeks morning. And he goes, why do you care two weeks notice? You're starting on Monday. So I show up not knowing what I was making, not knowing my salary, not knowing anything. I show up on Monday, I'm in a suit and tie, right? Hmm. Yeah. For the record business, that's definitely a no-no, okay? So I, I show up in a suit and tie and I was at Island Records for 11 years from, from that day and I had no idea the day I walked in the door, what I was making. But I knew I wanted to leave Arthur Young as soon as I possibly could. So that, that was my start in the music business. And funny enough, um, I worked for Chris Blackwell for 11 years and things come full circle. We just bought the uh, Bob Marley catalog and Blue Mountain Music, which included Free and Toots and the Maytels and John Martin and Chaka Demas and Pliers great, probably the biggest, most important reggae catalog in the world. We just bought it from Chris Blackwell about two months ago. So interestingly, I was with him for 11 years. Um, I was his, you know. You were his right hand man. Right hand confidant <coughs> for because 11 years. Chris was an entrepreneur and I think he still has today, he has uh, rum, yep. a couple of liquors, but he had other businesses and you were, when I met you, you were running Chris's Empire, which literally was not only Island Records, but he had hotels, and I think there was a healthcare service business. And well, we, yeah, so in about, uh, yeah, so in 1989, I started running Island Records with him. Um, and I thought I knew everything, by the way, in 1989 about the record business, and I realized the first day I started, I knew nothing about the business. And then a couple of years later, I started, uh, he asked me to help him with his personal businesses, which was outside the record business. Um, and that was, um, you know, you probably, I don't know if you guys have been to LA, but there's a hamburger chain out there called Fat Burger, and he owned Fat Burger. He owned a Japanese animation company. He owned a hotel company in South Beach. He owned, he owned a lot of businesses that 
really didn't relate to one another. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, that's all fell under the island group. Um, and I was there for 11 years, um, and 11 incredible years. And then um, in, two, in uh, 2000, uh, Clive Davis uh, was let go. He's fired by, uh, by Bertelsmann. He was running Arista Records, legendary record guy. And uh, I came in in 2000 with L.A. Reid to run Arista Records. How, how do you leave Island to go at another company? I mean, you're like family there with you that know, guy. You know, yes. Um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, Island was one big happy family. But, um, you know, um, I was spending too much time in the non-music areas of his businesses. And... Um, I really wanted to get back into the, music. the yeah, into music, just music. Um, and it was a very unique opportunity because Arista at the time was the biggest label in the world. Um, and, you know, it had artists like, um, you know, Whitney Houston and TLC and Dido and Pink and Usher and Outkast and Santana, you know, on and on and on, amazing amazing artists, and uh, it was an opportunity that uh, I felt I needed to do. That had to be hard to leave, but <clears throat> you served your time well at Arista, keeping them afloat. So Arista for four years, and then I made a huge mistake. The, um, the uh, evil empire, which was Sony at the time, in, um, in 2004 announced that the they and BMG which included Arista, RCA, et cetera, were gonna merge. And the gentleman that I had actually reported into when I was at Island, Chris was the chairman, but uh, I'd reported to Chris and also the, the gentleman that ran the, 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 uh, the group company called Polygram, a gentleman named Juan Levy asked me to come and work at Virgin Records. Uh, so made a, made a made a big mistake <laughs> and, and left uh, Ariston BMG and went to run Virgin Records, um, and you're gonna laugh, Virgin Records in 2004. And for those of you who are music uh, and Super Bowl aficionados will know that in, uh, in late January, early February of, uh, of 2004, Janet Jackson had a wardrobe, wardrobe malfunction and Janet Jackson was the biggest artist on Virgin Records at the time. And so I, in January, uh, had been offered the job, accepted the job, but I had to, I had to wait a while because my, I still had a contract at Arista. Um, so it took me four months to get the Virgin Records from Arista Records. And in the meantime, uh, Janet had that wardrobe malfunction with Justin Timberlake. And MTV banned, Steve will remember this, MTV banned Virgin uh, and all Virgin artists and all Virgin music videos from being played on MTV because of the wardrobe malfunction. So when I, when I got to Virgin, it was literally a dead label. I mean, uh, there was, let's see, there was Janet Jackson who could no longer have her videos played on MTV. There was the Rolling Stones who decided they were leaving Virgin. Uh, they had released uh, 40 Licks, which was their you know, a big album. They decided they were done with Virgin. There was Lenny Kravitz who stopped selling records. And, uh, and literally, Pharrell Williams said he would never record for Virgin. And Matt Serletic, who was the chairman of the Virgin at the time. So I show up in April, uh, I think it was April of 2004, to a label that was unrecognizable to, uh, to, uh, to most people. And so uh, I, I quickly decided that, by the way, is, at the time, the record business was starting to go like this, right? Because CDs were, uh, were slowing down dramatically, you know, MP3s and piracy was really rampant in the business. And uh, so I decided then, whoops, I don't know if you can hear me. I decided in, uh, in 2004, I'm, I'm sorry, in 2006, I was there for two years, that I was going to start uh, a new company on my own called Primary Wave. And the impetus for starting Primary Wave was very simple. That 
Um, Frontline record labels, okay, like Arista, like Virgin, like Columbia, like Atlantic, uh, Def Jam, et cetera, were, were really only interested in, uh, in breaking new and developing artists. So, you know, the Justin Biebers of the world, the Ariana Grandes of the world, et cetera, et cetera. And not back then, today. Um, you know, back then it was other, other, other new artists. And nobody really cared at any of the major labels about the icons and the legends, right? Like Def Leppard, like Aerosmith, like Nirvana. Um, hard for me to believe because those were seminal acts that, you know, I kind of grew up in the business with or <coughs> grew up listening to. And while frontline labels had 150 people marketing brand new artists at the time like Avril Lavigne and Sarah McLachlan and Dido and Pink and Usher and Outkast, right? They may have had a couple of people, not 150, but a couple of people that were focusing on their big catalog iconic artists. So I left, I, I decided I was gonna leave the major label business and I was gonna start a music publishing business which focused on icons and legends. And I got really, really lucky. And you know, always better to be lucky than good. And we were lucky, not good. We were really lucky. I raised, um, I raised a lot of money in a week in January of 2006 to start the company. We raised about um, $60 million in a week. And I got lucky again, which was because Courtney Love needed, needed a cash and she decided she was gonna sell half of Kurt Cobain's music publishing. And I was in the right place at the right time. I knew her lawyer. Her lawyer and I were very, uh, very friendly. He knew that if I said I would close a deal, that I would close a deal. And uh, so um, my, my first substantial acquisition at Primary Wave was the Kurt Cobain Nirvana catalog. And you know, Kurt was like the Elvis of the 90s. So you know, buying Kurt Cobain really put us on the map um, as a music publishing company, not a record label, but as a music publishing company. And um, we, uh, I staffed up pretty quickly after that. I brought over my head of marketing from Island Records, my head of marketing, uh, not Ar uh, Arista Records, my head of marketing from Virgin Records, the head of rock marketing at Epic Records. And I started to do what other companies didn't do. Right, so most other music publishing companies, you guys know the difference between music publishing and records, right? Yeah. Master recordings are, is basically a record label that's voices on a sound recording and publishing is the ownership of the copyright, it's the songs. So I was in the record business, now I'm in the music publishing business. By the way, I had no idea what the music publishing business was when I started a music publishing company. Um, that's true? Yeah, I had no idea, I mean I knew I knew that music publishing got paid when records were sold and I knew what a mechanical was, but I had no idea in music publishing you actually made money when the song was played on the radio and that you licensed music um, at uh, negotiated rates. I had so, no idea. So let me see if I got this right. You get hired away from an accounting firm to be the head of the record label and you never knew anything about the record business. Right. Then you get the idea to start a publishing company and you know nothing about music publishing. Pretty much. Okay. So, draw your own conclusion. That was 12 years ago. Okay. Yeah, I know a little bit about way, publishing. By the way, after you saw that display there, you know that he learned very quickly. So he's a quick learner. What I was impressed was when you started the company, you set the tone, yeah, you, you got the publishing of Kurt Cobain, but what did you do? Uh, other than a piece of paper and a press release. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So no, no, you, you put something together yeah. that's pretty amazing. Yeah, so, so I was starting to say, so most music publishers boast about how well they collect, right? What, what I mean by that is music publishers aren't record companies, okay? Record companies market, they promote historically. Music publishers were staid, boring financial you know, oriented companies and added very little value, in my opinion. They wouldn't say that, but in my opinion, 
music publishers historically, and even today, add very little value to the creative process, add very little, add very little value to artists. That's normally what artists look to their record label to do. I wanted to change the paradigm. So the major music publishers have a lot of royalty people, they have a lot of copyright administrators, they've got a lot of accountants and lawyers, and, and licensing people, okay? So when the phone rings, a licensing person at a major, rec a major music publisher picks up the phone, and they say, thank you for calling. You know, we'll license this to you for $20,000. They put the phone down, they give each other high fives for doing such a great job of marketing, and they collect, right? So I wanted to do it the other way around. I said, and still today say, that the collection, the administration function of paying royalties, of collecting um, uh, income around the world, that's a commodity that I rent for very little money. Okay? <coughs> so if I would bring that infrastructure in, it would cost me millions of dollars. Instead, I'm administration agnostic. I deal with Sony, Warner, BMG, Universal, and I have non-exclusive deals with all of them to, to collect for us around the world and administrate around the world. What I do, what our 100 people do, is what they don't do, which is, we have a 12-person digital team, so today the world is digital. Music is distributed digitally. You guys, I'm sure very few of you go and buy CDs anymore. You're on Spotify, you're on Apple, you're Pandora, you're Tidal, and that's how you're getting music. I want to give that service to our writers and our artists, so we are doing social media for them. We're doing e-commerce for them. We're pitching all the DSPs and all of the playlists, right? So, so we're doing that. We, we have brand people in our company, so we're pitching Coca-Cola, we're pitching Converse, we're pitching brands, and because I have no idea what a music publishing company is, because I never ran one before 12 years ago, and I still don't know what a music publisher does, right? Because we don't publish sheet music anymore, so I don't even know why they call it music publishing, but they do, or people do. We have marketing people. So I run it like a label. And it's the reason why we've been able to attract talent over others because, and it's still shocking to me that nobody else really does this, we run it like a record company, we run it like a marketing and branding company, whereas most music publishers, when they pitch Smokey Robinson, for instance, they talk about how great they collect in Argentina and Chile and Germany, et cetera, we let them talk about that and we talk about how we're going to put Smokey Robinson's songs in commercials, in movies, in television shows, etc. So we are very marketing oriented. By the way, almost every artist you saw up there, except for one, we have bought or done business with only in the last 18 months. So. That's only 18 months worth of artists. But I, but I wanted to mention what you, when you did, what the Cobain catalog, what did you do other than send out a press release? Because yeah. you showed your marketing. Yeah. You, yeah. you did something very unique, I thought. Yeah, so, so we had to show artists that we were different and that we actually did some work. Because uh, as I said, most music publishers you know, sitting back and, and letting the record labels do a lot of the marketing smartly. But, you know, why spend money marketing if somebody else can do it? So the, one of the first things we did when we bought the, uh, the Kurt Cobain catalog, we said, okay, Kurt's a legend. We don't want to license to Wendy's or McDonald's, you know, seeing a Kurt Cobain song in a, uh, in a hamburger commercial would be sacrilegious for for the fans, and we don't want to diminish the value of what we just bought. So what do we do that's really true to Kurt Cobain, who he was, and his legacy? So we realize that you know, Kurt Cobain wore Converse sneakers, right? Kurt, I mean, literally lived and died in Converse sneakers, and that's all he wore. Um, so we went to Converse. One of my, my marketing people went to Converse and said, we want to do a Kurt Cobain Converse sneaker. And literally, Converse thought they died and went to heaven, right? That, 
how could they possibly be this lucky that they're going to put out a Kurt Cobain sneaker? We said, well, you can't just put out a Kurt Cobain sneaker because that means that Courtney Love and Kurt's estate will make all the money, right? Because we're a music company. We're not a, a merchandising company. We're not a, we don't own the name and likeness. Kurt's family does. So what we did to create a music deal out of sneakers was, I should have brought, brought a pair. We put the lyrics of Kurt's songs and his, and his you know, music-related stuff on the sides of the sneakers, and it became one of Converse's best-selling niche sneakers. I think we had, had uh, two different runs, eight different styles, and we made a lot of money off of selling sneakers. We made a royalty off of every sneaker that they sold. Um, but you know, more importantly, that's something that we were able to show Steven Tyler when we went to buy Aerosmith songs and we were competing. We said, Steven, show us somebody, go talk to somebody who's come up with a concept like Converse sneakers for Kurt. And that was a big selling point. So one of the, one of the cool things um, that we did for, um, for Aerosmith on the marketing side, and again, we, we love to do things that have never been done before for lots of reasons, but it's a really great selling point when you show an artist who you're sure. trying to do business with, yep. hey, look, we did this, this, and this. It's never been done before. We were the first company to do this. We're going to do something similar for you or for, for your songs. So, so um, this one I, I, I loved. One of my, uh, one of my uh, brand guys was pitching us on, a, on an idea. And what, be, I mean, you guys know Aerosmith, right? And the big song is Dream On. The biggest song they have is Dream On. What better song or name for a lottery is there than Dream On, right? I mean, lottery, Dream On, makes total sense to me anyway. So, so one of my guys called up a company called G-Tech. Uh, you probably never heard of them, but I think they license about 50% of the world's lotteries. I think they own the Spanish lottery, the Portuguese lottery. They did the Massachusetts lottery. They, did, they, they've done, they do tons of lotteries in America. Lotteries meaning like scratch-off games and, and those sort of things. So we pitched, one of my marketing guys pitched GTEC on a concept. And so we all piled into a, into a car. <coughs> we drove up to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, where GTEC was based. And we had storyboards printed up. We had mock scratch-off games printed up. And we presented the chief marketing officer this idea to do a scratch-off game in Massachusetts because the band, Aerosmith, was from Massachusetts, from Boston. We were pitching them on doing a Massachusetts lottery. And they were looking at us you know, like we were crazy. And we said, well, don't you like the idea? They, they didn't look like they liked the idea. They said, no, 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 we love the idea. But you guys are thinking too small. This isn't something for Massachusetts. We want to do this across all the United States. So we did a scratch-off game, and you may say, well, how is a scratch-off game music? Okay, and you're right. Most of, there's never been a music scratch-off, had never been a music scratch-off game before. So we called it Dream On, which is a copyrighted, you know, phrase. That was our music. And under each of the scratch-off boxes was a song title. And so that created a music deal and we got a royalty on every one of those lottery tickets sold in America, Oof. which was awesome. But even better, um, we synchronized the song Dream On in each of the state's television commercials. So we got Think. hundreds of thousands of dollars for synchronizing the songs and the videos, right? Because Aerosmith was coming out with a new album we got G-Tech to do bus benches, bus stop benches, and billboards. And every time the song was played, we got a performance income. So, uh, yeah, so, it was, so those are the things that we like to talk about when we pitch a Smokey Robinson, for instance. So um, Smokey Robinson came into our office about 18 months ago. And we said, look, uh, we want to buy your songs. And Smokey's 77 years old, and the songs are worth a lot of money. Um, you know, one of the greatest American songwriters and poets, and incredible 
artist, incredible human being. And we sat with him and we said, look, you know, you're with Sony, which was through Motown, right? Sony bought the Joe Bett catalog, which is the Motown catalog. We said, look, tell us what Sony's done for you in the last 30 years. What have they done for you? And he said, well, they've collected for me. And I said, exactly, they've collected for you. What we're going to do is we're going to market for you. And we presented him a book this thick on a marketing plan. And we showed him the sneakers, we showed him the lottery tickets, we showed him all these things, and we said, Smokey, we want to do something for you that's never been done before. We are going to create for a music artist. We're going to create a holiday, okay? We're going to create a holiday for you. And he looked at us, okay, like we were crazy. Who's going to, you know, how are you going to make a holiday? Like President's Day or Fourth of July or Valentine's Day. So no, we're going to do it. So we, he sold us his songs. It was a lot of money. That was a very big, <coughs> that was a very big catalog. And first thing we did was we set out to create a holiday for Smokey Robinson. And we went to Hallmark and American Greetings, right? Because if Hallmark or American Greetings says something's a holiday, it's a holiday. Believe me. Okay? It's not the American government. Okay? It's Hallmark and American Greetings. So American Greetings bit, and we created every October 8th, starting in 2017, the second Sunday in every month now, is going to be, is Father Daughter Day, right? So it's Smokey Robinson's Father Daughter Day, and so you may say, well, how do you guys make money? You're a music company. It's a great question. How do we make money? Well, all the greeting cards, last year, because it was so late in the process, um, we, they couldn't get physical cards out, so it was all online. So it's Smokey Robinson's Father Daughter Day, my girl. So you open up this year, you're going to open up the greeting cards, and they're going to play My Girl. All of the commercials, you probably didn't see it, but the commercials on TV all played My Girl. And so every year now, from now until the end of time or until American Greetings and Hallmark says it's not a holiday anymore, every second Sunday in October is going to be Father Daughter Day, and they're going to be cards with Smokey Robinson's My Girl, and they're going to be television commercials and online ads, all with My Girl. And that's the whole thing for us, is to promote our music to get paid for our music. So anyway, just a little anecdote of Smokey. But do we do that with each one of the artists that we buy? You, you had to make a, an impression on the business that you were real. And when you did the Kurt Cobain catalog, you wanted to get the music out to people. How did you get the music out to the people? Ah, yeah. Well, 2000 and we bought that, we bought Kurt Cobain's catalog in 2006. So that was 12 years ago. 12 years ago, people were still buying CDs, people still listening to music on CDs, and music supervisors, advertising agencies, um, I'll tell you a funny story in a second about Aerosmith, where we did the same thing. So we did, you guys familiar with Kurt Cobain's music, you know, Nirvana? One of, their, one of the big songs is called Heart Shaped Box. Uh, Heart Shaped Box. So, uh, you know, we, we made a, a wooden heart-shaped box. And inside the box, we put CDs of every single song in his catalog, right? And we made 500 of them. When you opened up the top of the box, it was a big wooden heart-shaped box with a Kurt Cobain Nirvana logo on it. And every time you, one would open up the box, pull off the cover, it would pay the lullaby, lullaby version of heart-shaped box. So we made 500 of them, and we numbered them from one to 500, and we sent them to every important uh, advertising agency, creative director we knew, every major producer, we sent it to Spielberg, we spent it, you name it, we sent it to every major producer, music supervisor, um, whoever buys music, advertising agency head, um, television you know, producer, director, editor, sent 500 of them out, and we sent a note saying that if you sell them, we'll know, right? Because they were numbered on the back. And one, it's funny, one person, about a month later, we see it popping up on eBay, 
and the person must have been an idiot because we, everyone was numbered, we had a list of who we sent them to, and so we knew who was auctioning off the heart-shaped box on, on uh, eBay. So, but uh, you got people talking. Yeah, so, so I'll tell you one quick, quick story. Um, so Aerosmith, like the Kurt Cobain heart-shaped box, mm -hmm. we did an Aerosmith, meaning Steven Tyler is known for his handkerchiefs and his harmonica. Um, we scarf. made a, scarf. Scarfs, yeah, scarfs and, and harmonica. So we wrapped a harmonica box with a scarf. And we had a harmonica, the harmonica was, was this big, right? And when you opened up the harmonica box, inside the box was a little harmonica and all of Steven Tyler's Aerosmith songs on CDs, right? the entire catalog. But when you opened up the box, rather than playing the lullaby version of Harp Shape Box, played the song Dream On. It was literally just dream on, dream on, and you had to close the box because it was really annoying, right? <laughs> so we sent that, we made, I think we made a thousand of those. And we sent those harmonica boxes to everybody we thought were you know, consumers of music on the agency side, television side, phone side. Anyway, one funny story. So you guys, you guys probably wouldn't remember this guy, but the former chairman of NBC, two chairmen ago, was a guy named Ben Silverman. And Ben Silverman now, I think he runs a company called Electus. Um, at the time, he was the chairman of NBC and he, was, and he was a friend of ours. And I sent him this box. And I remember I show up in his office, we were actually pitching a television show to NBC. I show up in his office and there's the harmonica box sitting on his desk. And I, say, I said, Ben, this is great. You, you got the harmonica box we sent out sitting on the desk. He goes, oh my God, I love it, I love it. Because every time somebody comes in to pitch him and he doesn't like the pitch, he just lifts up the harmonica box and it says, dream on, dream on, and kicks him out of the office. So that, that was his way of saying, it's never going to happen. Yeah, so anyway. Wow. Got a lot of those stories. All right. Um, <clears throat> So I wanted to get to some of the class questions, if that's okay with you. Sure. So uh, Fatima wanted to know, what's the decision process when choosing whether to sell certain publishing rights or not? For the artist or for us? Fatima? Oh, uh, for, the, um, for you. For the publisher? Well, actually, now I think about it for both, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well... We, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't typically sell individual songs or individual catalogs, right? So our thing now is we want to acquire as many song catalogs, iconic, legendary songs, ca song catalogs as possible. So if, if, we, um, if we were to ever sell um, our current catalog, um, it would be because we felt that we've, um, you know, commercially done everything we possibly could with the catalog, that the environment made sense. But we're, we're in the business for, for a very long time. So we, we're not really thinking about, um, you know, selling our catalog or, or um, you know, in the near term, what the disposition may be. But from an artist perspective, which I care greatly about. Um, artists, you know, it's interesting. When I started in, uh, in 2006, 12 years ago, um, you know, I was dealing mainly with artists in their late 50s and late 60s. And, um, and you know, artists don't feel uh, mortal. <laughs> when they're in their 50s or early 60s. Um, and so there weren't as many deals back 12 years ago as there are now because artists that were 50s and 60s 12 years ago now are, you know, mid-60s, late 70s now. And when you get to 70, I think, you feel a lot more mortal and the end is, you know, near. And... Uh, they're more interested in how they protect their families, estate planning. The tax laws now are very advantageous because you get capital gains as an artist when you sell your catalog, but when you get your 
annual royalty streams, its ordinary income, much more advantageous to sell with capital gains because you keep a lot more of your money. And artists in their 70s are thinking about the house in Hawaii or the, you know, the, the third or fourth home, and they've got reasons to want to cash out. Um, more importantly, we take a different approach than uh, most companies do. We like to team up with the artists. We like to partner with the artists. So we don't like to buy 100%, right? So most companies like to buy 100% and take the artist out and be done with the artist. That's not our approach because we're a marketing company. It's so much easier and so much better to partner with an artist so they participate in the marketing and branding of their songs. So we, we typically only buy 50% or 75% of the catalog from the artist. So those are the reasons they sell. They want cash, they want an estate plan, they, they feel like um, you know, it's time, they're getting older. Um, th there are a lot of reasons why artists, artists sell, but uh, there are a lot more deals today than there ever have been because of, the, because of the age of the artists. Okay, uh, Christine had a question. She said, primary way of strives to maintain the integrity of your clients, including when to say no. Can you discuss why this is so important for a client and give an example of a time when you had to turn down an offer for a client? Um, yeah, there's, I got one in particular that, that I think you'll find interesting. So, you guys know Hall & Oates? Okay. You guys know those, those uh, Swiffer Mop commercials that used to come out? So, this is back... Uh, this is back like around 2009 or so. Um, one of my, one of my uh, commercial advertising guys ran into my office and says, Larry, Larry, I've got this amazing deal I just did. You know, let's, we got to call Daryl Hall and get him to approve it. And it was for a Hall & Oates song. I think Swiffer Mob was going to pay us somewhere like around five or $600,000 to use the song She's Gone in a Swiffer Mop commercial. And I don't know if you guys remember this, these commercials. They were fantastic. Like, they were Clio award-winning. They were, they were really fantastic, you know, creative commercials. So I said, oh my God, Ryan, this is amazing. Let's call Daryl. He's gonna, he's gonna flip. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I remember a group of us, we, we put Daryl Hall on speakerphone. I called Daryl, and it's like 11 o'clock in the morning, and I said, Daryl, I've got some great news for you. And he goes, hold it, hold it, hold it. He goes, and this is a true story, okay? He goes, he goes hold it, I, I had a dream last night. I had a, I had a dream, you, you were calling me at some commercial and I hated it and, and I think it was a Swiffer mop commercial and you know I'd never do that. You, like, you wouldn't be calling me about a mop commercial. You'd never do that to me. And I'm saying, Daryl, you gotta be kidding me. I go, Ryan just landed you a huge deal. And he goes, is it Swiffer? And I said, yeah. So how do you know that? He goes, oh my God, you can't do that. He says, I wrote that love song for my girlfriend. You can't put that in a Swiffer Mop commercial. And, and Hall and & Oates was one of the few catalogs that we ha had unfettered rights on. So we could, we could license that, these songs to literally anyone per our agreement with them, right? But Daryl would have been so upset because he wrote this song for his girlfriend, right? It was a love song to his girlfriend, She's Gone, and had sent him a meeting to him. And he and I argued vociferously, okay, for months until the, the advertising agency said, we need, it, we need an answer. And we turned it down because we knew had we done it, it would have been a huge fee. I mean, that is a big fee for a Hall & Oates song, um, Daryl would not have been friendly with us and it would have been difficult to deal with him. So we turned it down. So it's not often an artist turns down a half a million dollar commercial for one song, a 30 second spot, but he didn't want us to do it and we didn't do it. <clears throat> the other question uh, Christine asked was, she said, moving forward, 
<clears throat> what new innovations would you like to incorporate into primary ways that you don't currently provide? Um, that's a good question. Um, what new innovations? Well, you know, streaming has been a, a big boom for the music business in general. And, um, you know, um, it's, it's a relatively new area for publishers. As I was saying, you know, we, I, I don't know of another publisher that has people that pitch, promotion people that pitch for playlists. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to even more digital services popping up, more ways um, for people to get access to our music. I love, you know, Alexa. I love, you know, all of Amazon and Google and all of the, you know, the, st the, the technology that they're doing. The more technology for us, the better, because unlike, um, unlike record labels, uh, we make money in performance income, at least for the moment. Um, record companies don't at the moment. Um, so the more places where our music can be heard, the better. Um, there is better tracking now. So um, there's a, there's, there's um, there, I forgot the name of the company, but we use, we're using technology now um, to track where our songs are played in commercials all around America. So can't get away with not paying us on a commercial anymore. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just looking forward to new innovation. Okay. Uh, Gina wanted to ask you, when artists or bands uh, sign with Primary Wave, are they required to be contracted under all of Primary Wave's domains, or can they be exclusive to just one aspect of the company, such as publishing or just management? Oh. Yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, we're talking a lot about publishing, but we do have, we do have a big management company as well. We manage um, CeeLo Green, Cypress Hill, Melissa Etheridge, Yanni, Plain White Tees. We just signed Chris Robinson um, from the Black Crows. Um, so we, we've got about 40 artists that we manage. Um, you can sign with us for just management. You can sign with us for publishing. Um, um, but, but when you sign with us for publishing, you have to sign with us for all of publishing. So you can't just sign with us for sync use or you know, collecting mechanicals. You gotta sign with us for everything in publishing. And in management, you have to sign with us for everything also. So if we're managing, you're managing your career. 360? Not just one act. It's a 360? Yeah. The management? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jorge asked, if you've acquired catalogs from many recognized artists worldwide, have you ever wanted to make a deal that ended going away? Did I, did I ever want to make a deal that I wanted to go away? No, that, that you didn't get. Oh, God, are you kidding? All the time. <laughs> All the time. Yeah, I'll tell you. Okay, you want another story? Or am I boring you? Are you kidding? <laughs> want another one? So, um, so have you guys heard of... Um, Lieber and Stoller. Okay, you've never heard of Lieber. You probably haven't heard of Lieber. So Lieber and Stoller were the greatest American writing duo in history. I mean, they wrote incredible, you know, um, Elvis Presley songs. Uh, I mean, they, they were incredible, okay? And many millions of dollars. Um, they, uh, this was a jewel. Um, a jewel of a catalog. It wasn't an artist. It was songwriters. Okay, so a little bit different. We do much better when we sign artists that are songwriters like Smokey, Bob Marley, you know, Def Leppard, as opposed to, you know, you probably saw up there um, under Holly Knight, you're thinking, well, that's Tina Turner. That's not Holly Knight. Holly Knight wrote those songs. Tina Turner performed those songs. So we like to sign singer-songwriters. But there are the cases where, like with Holly Knight, who was the premier songwriter of the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s, will sign songwriters if they're not artists. Lieber and Stoller um, were 
I, you know, they, you know, I'm blanking on all of Kansas City, Hound Jailhouse Dog. Rock, Hound Dog. I mean, amazing Rock. songs. Uh, I Am Woman, I can go on and on. So I put a huge offer, huge offer into Lieber and Stoller. Knew their attorney, put a big offer in, and I'm going to tell you. So I put a multiple in to buy their songs for 18 times, okay? And most people, most companies are sold on net income, okay? Publishing is sold on margin, right? So 18 times margin is a much bigger number than 18 times net income, right? So I put an offer of 18 times gross margin for their songs. I think, I think they were doing, oh my God, I don't know, $4 million a year in their songwriting earnings? I don't know, it was close to $70 million or so that I, the, an offer we put in. Something like that. I, it's, this was a long time ago. This is back in like 2009. Um, and we only had one competitor. These guys were, at the time, they were in their mid to upper 70s, okay? They were, they were getting up there in age, and they wanted to sell to us. But their kids, <laughs> who they were leaving all the money to, wanted the most money possible. They didn't care who they were selling to, they wanted the most money possible. Jerry Lieber and, and, and Mike Stoller wanted to sell to us because they liked us. And they weren't talking to anybody else other than Sony ATV. So, Sony Music. So, Sony put in a bid of 20 times, okay? And Lieber and Stola came back to us and said, which is unheard of, by the way, I mean, 20 times, 20 multiple, that's a lot. You know, at the time, most of these catalogs were going for 10 times, 11 times. But this was incredible. I mean, an incredible catalog. So, Sony put an offer 20 times. I remember I flew out three different times to Los Angeles to sit on, on Jerry Lieber's porch in Venice Beach, okay? And I had listened to the same story five times every time I went out to Venice Beach to sit with him and Mike Stoller. I'd hear the same story and Mike Stoller would lean in and say, Larry, just listen to the story, just listen to the story. And I'd listen to these stories over and over again and every time I'd leave, I'd put in an offer which was a little more. And Sony would come back and put in an offer which was a little more than me. They'd never go out. they just put in an offer a little more than me. So finally, I said, look, guys, here's my final offer. I put an offer of, 20, I think it was 21 times margin for the Lieber and Stoller catalog. And Sony finally came back in and put in an offer of 23 times, okay? Which was, you know, insanely ridiculous. So I said to the guys, you got to make a decision. I'm not moving. They're at 23 times. I'm at 21 times. You got to make a decision. And this was after almost six months of going back and forth. And I'll never forget, I flew out to, I flew out to LA and Jerry had his sons and Mike had his sons in a room and they were going to take a vote. Okay. So they all voted. Jerry and Mike voted for us. But the four sons voted for the more money because they were the heirs, right? And so Sony ended up getting, getting the catalog. But that was, that was one that I really, really, really wanted. It's a great catalog. Great, great catalog. But we didn't get it. Somebody up at us. And so, Sony still has it. Sony still has it, yeah. Yep. And so everybody in this room knows that all those songs because they've done such a great job exploiting them. Exactly my point. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you think then with that money that you did not spend on the catalog, did you ever look back and, and see, so what did we do with that money and calculate, did we end up making more in the long run on the other investments we made with that same amount of money? Well, it would have been a dumb thing for us to do to buy that catalog for that much money. Right. Um, because it's really, you know, it's really hard to ultimately get a return when you pay that much money for something. Um, uh, but it, it turned out, uh, it turned out, you know, uh, that we ended up not buying the Libra Stoller catalog, but we bought the Beatles, you know, piece of the Beatles, and we bought um, we bought a lot of we bought a lot of things after that um, that we probably 
we probably would have tapped out uh, had we had we not uh, had we bought that that catalog because very interestingly in 2008 to not, when, when was the financial crisis it was 2009 yeah so August 2009 um, when when the financial crisis hit the guys that we that were backing us are a hedge fund called Plainfield Asset Management they went out of business during the financial crisis so we were spending like like crazy up until 2009 buying these incredible catalogs and Lieber and Stoller was right before that that time the world fell apart our hedge fund went out of business and then we lost the ability for a bunch of years to buy assets that big so um, you know good news bad news so probably better we didn't buy it but it would have been you know an amazing catalog to, to own and exploit and market <coughs> uh, Danilo asks this question to how has the 300 million dollar partnership with BlackRock affected your market Affected the what? Your market. What do you mean affected the market? Danilo? Danilo, are you here? Hmm. Okay, well, then I guess we'll move on. Here's a question from Jade. Wanted to know, since you had such a close relationship with VMG and Bertelsmann, it seemed like an easy decision to work with them. What's the thought process when deciding whom to share an artist's work with in another company? That's a really good question. Um, well, well, uh, it's not easy uh, in 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 a creative business to 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 share artists with multiple companies. So, if you're going to do that, and we don't, we're not in business with BMG anymore. We had a three-year venture with them from 2013 to 2016 that, that ended um, that we didn't want to renew. Um, the cultures of the companies are just you know, very different. We're, we're exceptionally entrepreneurial. They're a little more corporate. Very hard to share artists, writers, et cetera, with two different cultures. They're a very good company, but they're different than we are. And so we, we, uh, we approach things differently. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're going to share an artist with another company, you really have to be sure that you're on the same uh, creative wavelength. That's true. <clears throat> okay, another, another topic here. Uh, Joe Hahn, I wanted to know that uh, because we work in a publishing department for quite some time, do you think eventually sampling will be easier to clear since it becomes so popular? Ooh, another good question. Will it become easier to clear? Well, I think if you look out 10 years from now, I think there will be a central repository for clearances, right? For sync clearances, for samples, for a lot of things. But the artist will always maintain uh, a sense of control, right? Because I don't want, I don't want any artist just sampling Bob Marley. You know, I, I want to make sure that we have a, we maintain a level of, of control. So I do think, whoever asked the question, I think it's going to get easier to clear things. But uh, I don't see artists or companies ever giving up ultimate control over how a sample is used. And I'll give, give you an example. You know, we, we work with every genre of music. I mean, you know. We have very little country music, but we have some country music, right? So, Barb Marley stood for peace, for you know, brotherly love, for you know, all races, creeds, religions, everybody, you know, peacefully working together, being together, um, harmony. So, if if there was if there was a rapper that was, you know, lyrically very challenging, um, you know, that was uh, misogynistic, that was uh, violent, that was, you name it, I mean, we would never agree to sample Bob Marley's music if it wasn't, you know, and, and plus, 
the family would have a, a say. Sure. So, um, you know, uh, I, think, I think those issues will never go away. But the process, aside from the artist involvement, will be streamlined? I think so. You know, you know a big problem, a huge problem in the music business today is there's no central repository yet for, uh, for people knowing all, you know, publishers, all writers, all this and that. You have to, you know, you file with the copyright office, but um, in order to clear a song, you have to have 100% of the writers. So if I wrote 99% of a song and Steve wrote 1% of the song and I want it in a Coca-Cola ad and it's a million dollar ad, Coca-Cola's got to clear it with me and Steve. I may own 99% of the song, but he's got an interest in it, and so it all has to be cleared. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Daniela want to know who are your biggest influences in terms of your own executive style? Um, well, uh, I've been influenced by almost everybody I've worked with uh, in the music business. Some know, <laughs> for good reason. Um, but the most influential, I have to say, um, the most influential was Chris Blackwell. So he's the founder uh, of Island Records, of Island Pictures, and he was very non-traditional. And that's exactly how I run Primary Wave. I mean, I remember, I remember I worked with him for 11 years at Island, and we had board meetings on Wave Runners in the Bahamas or in the Caribbean, wherever he had a house, when he had a lot of houses and in warm places, great places. So we'd have board meetings, you know. On a board. On a, on a wave runner, yeah. So uh, that's not what I grabbed from him though. <laughs> he was, I mean this guy was incredible. I, 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 you know, only wish I had the business acumen he does or did. Um, I only wish I had the creative acumen he does, he did. Um, he's a very unusual guy because he was a brilliant businessman, he was a brilliant marketer, he was a record producer, and he was very carefree, and he ran a very um, loose business. And when I say loose, I don't mean disorganized. Um, he let people make decisions. And funny enough, I mean, very unusual guy, the more you screwed up, the more he supported you, okay? The more you had success, the less he supported you, meaning, right. All right, you're having success, great, you don't need my help. But if you're screwing up, you need my help. <coughs> and his carefree lifestyle was quite amazing. I mean, he would travel around the world. He was a nomad. But he wouldn't have any luggage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was amazing. He, because Life's great if you can travel and not have any bags. He, <laughs> or baggage. And he or had baggage, right, baggage. <laughs> he, he would travel to New York or Florida and because he had a hotel or an apartment, he'd stop at the hotel and go to the gift shop and pick up a T-shirt. And uh, if he didn't have his flip-flops, he'd get a pair of flip-flops. And he didn't need to... Listen, this... He sold... To give an idea, this is interesting. He, he sold Island Records for $300 million to Polygram Records in 1989. And I just had, I just had uh, lunch with him about two weeks ago. And he's wearing the same, I could swear he's wearing the same sweatshirt, T-shirt that he was wearing back when I was working for him in the 90s. I mean, he's just that type of down-to-earth, chill, incredible guy. You would never know that he was, you know, a titan of the music business. He's just very low-key. Unassuming unassuming, great, and brilliant guy. He really is. Uh, the other question Danielle asked, which I thought would be interesting, is um, what, if you could give two key pieces of advice to somebody just entering in the business, what would that be? Well, two years ago, my greatest advice that I could have, that I could have given you guys was don't go into the business. Um, that's, that's changed a little bit because, because uh, streaming has really changed the music business in an amazingly positive way. Um, 
you know, one of the things that streaming did was literally overnight it killed piracy. So piracy, you know, siphoned off billions of dollars a year in, in the worldwide music business. You know, you guys, I'm sure you filed, shared, I'm sure you, you know, I'm sure you didn't illegally, you know, use music that uh, wasn't paid for. Um, that doesn't happen anymore because, you know, there's a free service for Spotify, ad supported service. There's, you know, there's Pandora. There's lots of places you can go and get all you can eat music for, for free. You just have to watch an ad. Um, that's, that's pretty powerful. So, you know, subscription, the subscription services are going like this with paid subscriptions. And the music business, especially the record business, is, is more healthy now than it's been in a decade. So, you know, if I were to give, if I were to give you guys um, any advice, it would be, uh, one, to get started, you know, as early as possible. Because in the music business, unless you're managing your friend from college's band, um, or unless your father um, owns a record company or a music publishing company, you got to start as an assistant. So you don't, you don't come in, you know, you don't come in, even if you're a Harvard or Yale grad, you don't come in as the head of marketing. It just doesn't happen. And the music business is one of those businesses, you need experience, you need relationships, you need seasoning, you have to understand how to deal with artists. I mean, it doesn't happen by coming in in a VP level or director level position. It starts by working for people, you know, like Steve, who are seasoned, who know what they're doing, who show you the ropes, and you gradually, you know, um, get into it and it's in a creative position, right? In a in a business position, you know, it's slightly different. You know, if you're going to go and and, and in, into and be a lawyer, um, you know, you 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 don't have to be an assistant. You'd start as a lawyer, but um, you're certainly not running a department. So, um, you know, I would start if you love music and you want to be in the bit. You got to love music because if you don't love music, it's a very hard way to go up the ladder and earn a living. Um, so one, uh, start early, and two, you got to be really, really passionate about being in the music business because it, it's, it's um, not an easy business. Not a nine to five. It's, it's not, it is, it is not nine to, it's nine, it's, you know, nine to whenever. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I, uh, I mean, there's not a week that I don't Well, you're, le you're leaving here tonight, and then you wake up tomorrow morning, and you told me you're going? Going to Miami. And then uh, I, I travel every week, <clears throat> so, which my wife loves, by the way. <laughs> my kids don't love it. My wife loves it. Okay. Nick had a question. He said, Spotify just went public today on the New York Stock Exchange. What are your thoughts on how this will impact streaming and the music business as a whole, and how or will it have an impact on primary wave? Well, I know Spotify opened at, I think, uh, what was it, 132 and went up to 160 and then came back down. And we're all in the music business hoping that Spotify does well because, you know, Spotify now is a behemoth along with Apple. So we certainly want Spotify, uh, Spotify to do well. And, you know, it is now all about streaming. It's, it's not about CDs anymore. It's about, it's about streaming. So Spotify better do well. <laughs> but, but let me just say this. That as a publisher, um, you know, Spotify has a, a positive impact but not nearly as big as it has in the record business. Record, record royalties from Spotify are, I think, six, six times that of a publisher. And don't some of the labels own a piece of Spotify, so they did okay today on the, with the stock. Yep, they did. We didn't. Okay. We didn't own any piece of Spotify. Right. <laughs> uh, Caitlin says... Uh, Larry, out of all the times you've been recognized for your success in places such as Billboard, New York Times, what's the biggest accomplishment or the proudest moment that you've had since founding Primary Wave back in 2006? Um, 
You know, um, <laughs> one of the things that, um, that my team, and by the way, everybody's a partner in the company. We don't, we don't have staff. We just, we have partners. I never say somebody's my employee or my staff or this. We, we have partners, only partners. So one of the things that we kind of uh, moan should, about. You should explain that a little bit more. When, what's a, what does a, a partner mean? Well, they're a salaried employee. A salaried employee. But when somebody's with a, when somebody's with a company for a number of years, they're eligible for uh, profits, interest in the company. And uh, even if they're not, um, we even if they don't have profits, interest, they are partners in the company because. People that are treated as a partner treat artists and treat people that are doing business with us differently. And so I have never said to the woman who's my assistant, oh, you're my assistant, She's my partner. Our receptionist is our partner. My head of marketing is my partner. Um, some people think we have about almost, I don't know, close, to, we had at one point close to 30 people had profits interests in the company. I think we have 90, 90 people or so in the company. So a third of the people in the company share in the success of the company um, from a financial perspective. Um, so one of those, just getting back to the question, one of the things that we kind of bemoan each other about is we don't really stop and celebrate uh, our successes. So I think, um, I think uh, you know, in, the, in our marketing meeting, we, uh, we announced the Bob Marley deal. <laughs> and it wasn't like we had a dinner or pop champagne or celebrated. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's a little unusual. Uh, a lot of people would celebrate. We are just literally about growing and acquiring and marketing and every time we have a big sink use or a Super Bowl commercial or some sneaker deal, you know, it that's, gives us a lot of pride and, and joy. But we don't, uh, we don't celebrate a lot of our successes. So I can't tell you, you know, what, what's, what's the, what was it, what was the... the well, what was the, one, of, one of the things, what are you most proud of that you've accomplished? Yeah, I think, I think um, only because... I think Bob Marley is, you know, may not be the biggest artist in terms of revenue generation, may not be the most um, recognizable artist to 16-year-old kids, but there really is no place in the world you can go where people as a whole don't know Bob Marley, where his songs aren't played, and he is a true global citizen, a global artist. So I, I think I'm most proud right now of the fact, even though the Beatles were my favorite band of all time, <laughs> you know, I think Bob Marley is really something that, uh, you know, that acquisition is really something that I'm personally um, very proud of. And in that acquisition, funny enough, um, most people, uh, we had a big New York Times article about this. Um, most people don't focus on not only did we buy Bob Marley in that transaction, but we bought Free and John Martin and Toots and the Maytels and Chakademus and Pliers and you know, uh, lots and lots of great music. But um, All Right Now by Free, I don't know if you guys know that song. That's, that's, that's probably one of my top five favorite songs of all time. And it's so cool, if you're into music, it's so cool to be able to own one of your favorite songs of all time. So, you know, I love Free. But Bob Marley is really like, I, 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 it's iconic. Fair, I mean, it's, it's pinnacle. Okay. Um, coming near the close, just want to see if anybody had any questions that they wanted to ask. And please, let's do it now. Yes, young lady. How did you make $60 million in a week? <laughs> oh, I didn't make 60 million. I raised yes. $60 million. How did you That is a big difference, by the way. <laughs> yes. How? Yeah. All right. So how much time do we have? 
enough for you to explain that. Okay, I don't know. It may not be. So I'm going to tell you a, a quick story of, of, remember I said I got lucky? Better be lucky than good when I started? So I'm going to tell you how this happened, okay? And, and you're not going to believe it, okay? But it is absolutely true, okay? So, and I have to figure out how to tell this quickly so that it's not a day-long story. Um, so I left Virgin Records uh, around Thanksgiving of 2005, had this idea, wanted to start Primary Wave in January of 2006. I met a friend, uh, I was introduced to, uh, uh, to, uh, to a friend of a very big artist that I had had when I was at Island Records. And this guy said, gonna give you $100 million to start this company, love the idea, $100 million, great. So I'm like, phenomenal, right? Sure. This is great, I yeah. don't even have to go out and try. This is fantastic. So, so anyway, long story short, um, is a moral to the story, which is I should always listen to my wife, okay? <laughs> always. So this is very unlike me because I'm very organized. I like to do due diligence on things and people and deals we do and ultimately make a decision to do it or not, right, after some due diligence. Well, I didn't do any due diligence on this guy whatsoever because all I heard was, I'm gonna give you $100 million to start your company. That was all I needed to hear when I should have done my due diligence. Anyway, my wife says to me, and uh, so let me, a little more to the story. So I had, my first acquisition, before, three weeks before Kurt Cobain, was the MGM United Artist Music Publishing Library. <coughs> great library of music from movies and TV shows, okay? It's a big deal for us, but it wasn't an artist. Our first artist deal was Kirk Cobain. And I had to close this deal by March 31st because it was a year end for the company that was selling to me, okay? So this guy says, I'll give you $100 million. I say, great, we meet twice. He still wants to give me the $100 million. I'm like, let's get, the, let's get the lawyers drafting documents, okay? My wife says to me, and we're getting close to the March date, March 31st date of having to close and buy the MGM catalog for a lot of money. My wife says to me, um, so who is this guy? I was introduced to him by so-and-so. She says, but who is he? Is, have you done any background on him? And I said, why do I need to do a background? on him for, he's giving me $100 million. I said, really? She said, you better call your friend so-and-so, I'm leaving names out, so-and-so in San Francisco to see if he knows this guy. He said, I'm not gonna call him. He's, he, we're, we're closing this deal tomorrow. He's giving us the money tomorrow and we're gonna in turn buy this DMGM catalog. She said, you're making a big mistake. You, bet you should call your friend and see if he knows him and see if this is a good guy or not. I said, oh my God, okay, stop, stop, okay, I'll call, okay? So I call my friend who was a really legendary investor in San Francisco. And I say, do you know so-and-so? Amy wants to know, <laughs> she's making me call you, do you know so-and-so? And there's -so? silence at the other end of the phone. And I said, hello? <laughs> and he goes, he goes, Larry, if, you do business with this guy, don't ever call me again, okay? Don't ever call me again. True story. So he said, have you done your research on this guy? I said, oh my God. <laughs> so I can't remember, did I Google him? I don't remember what I did. I did a search and this was a bad guy. I mean, litigates with everybody, tax fraud, you name it, bad guy. So I am supposed to sign documents with this guy tomorrow, right? Okay? And can't go, I can't go into business with this guy. He's a horrible guy, being sued by everybody. Every business deal he gets into, I mean, a long list of bad things. So I call the guy, I have seven days to close the MGM catalog, and then three weeks after that, I have to buy Kurt Cobain. So now, I have no money. I literally have no money and I have a week to close MGM. I had to call this guy up and say, I'm sorry, I can't do business with you. Thank you. Goodbye. All right? And 
so that was on a that was on a Sunday night. Monday morning, I call a friend of mine from an investment banking house. Probably never heard of him. A bank called Allen and Company, small boutique, media bank, and. And I explained what happened, and he said, Larry, I told you this was too good to be true. I, I said, Richard, I don't want to hear that it's too good to be true. I need $60 million in a week. And he says, what do you tell you? We'll never do that. I, I said, well, I, well, I don't have a choice. If I don't raise this money, I'm going to be done in the music business. No one will ever do business with me. No one will do deals with me, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so they set me up with Credit Suisse, with a company called Golden Tree, with, I mean, every financial institution you can imagine, I took meetings with that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I, and so I took meetings with all these huge institutions and every one of them said the same thing. Said, this is great, we love the idea, but we need three months, maybe six months to close. And I said, I don't, I don't have three months, I don't have six months, I have a week. And they all laughed. Okay. But I got three term sheets out of it, out of these meetings, saying, hey, we're going to take three months, we'll give you the $60 million, but we need three months to do due diligence on you, to you know, run models, to blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I said, guys, I need $60 million in a week. So my very last meeting okay, was on a Wednesday. I'll never forget this. And I'll tell you the company. It was at a company called Falcon Investments in New York City. And they said on the phone, they said, we want to invest in media, we love media, come in, we love media. Okay, so I come in and I bring three books with me to describe the company, my vision, what I want to do, what we're going to spend the money on. I was sitting around the table and there were three partners and there was me and, and one of my other um, partners. We're sitting down, I'll never get this. We start the conversation and I say to them, I said, look, so you know the difference between master recordings and music publishing? And they look at me like they're, you know, goats with glass eyes, okay? And I said, you guys, you, okay, you don't know music, but you invest in media, right? You want to invest? So yeah, we invest in media, but we, you know, it's like cable companies. We invest in cable. I said, you don't invest in movies? No. You don't invest in music? No. Do, what, you invest in television, film? No, we invest in cable companies. I said, are you interested in music? Well, you know, we kind of liked what you had to say and we wanted to, I'm like, oh, guys, I don't have time for this. You got to be kidding me. So I get up. I'm so pissed off, okay? I get up. I walk out. And I say to my partner, let's go. We're leaving. I leave my three books, okay, on the table on the conference room table. I leave, I'm like, oh no, my life's ruined. I'm never gonna raise this money. You know, I'm never gonna buy Kurt Cobain. I'm never gonna buy MGM. My life's over. It's a disaster, okay? I get a phone call when I get home, okay? And this is, it's a guy named Joe Bensavanga from Plainfield Asset Management. He calls me and he says, Larry, I heard you're looking for money. We want to invest. And I said, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you, where did you get my number? And he goes, it doesn't matter. We want to invest. We like your vision, blah, blah, blah. I said, I can't deal. I can't deal with this. I got, I'm sorry, Joe. I've got three term sheets. They want to close in three months. I got to close in a week. He said, yeah, we like it. We like it. I said, Joe, I'm sorry. I, I can't deal with you. I hung up the phone, okay? I hung up the phone. So I'm sitting on my dining room table, I'm looking at these three term sheets, and I'm thinking, okay, which one do I try to go with? Maybe I can get the, the sellers to push it back a couple weeks. Maybe I can get these guys to not, you know, to close in a couple of weeks rather than three months, and nobody was budging. Joe Bensavanga calls me back an hour later, and he goes, Larry, don't hang up the phone. He goes, I have Max Holmes on the line. He's our, he's our head partner, he's our chief investment officer. We're gonna invest in your company. And I said, who are, who are you guys? Where did you get my name? He goes, did you just come from a company called Falcon Investments? And I said, yeah, I did. He goes, well, we were the next meeting, okay? Oh. And before the guys could come in, this is a true story, before the guys could come in, the, the guys from Falcon could come into the, to the, to the room. They had left our books on the table. Joe and Max were sitting around the table flipping through our book. 
And they took the book off the table and they put it in their briefcase. And after their meeting with Falcon, they left and they didn't ask Falcon about us. They just put our books in their briefcase. They went back to, Plain, to, to Greenwich, Connecticut, and they called. And I said, you mean you got my <coughs> book from Falcon? They said, no, no, we didn't get your book from Falcon. We took it off the table. We read it because they were late, and this is exactly what we're looking for. And I said, you guys must be kidding me. I said, you're going to give me $60 million just by, you know, we haven't even met. He goes, ah, oh, no, we love it, we love it. Have your lawyer send us a term sheet. So I called my lawyer. We sent them a term sheet that day. They said, come in the next morning. We'll close the deal. I went to Greenwich, Connecticut with my lawyer the next morning, and they funded us $60 million the next day, and we ended up buying the MGM cattle. That's how we got started. So that's why I said it's better to be lucky than good. And we were very lucky. And it turns out that these guys were incredible partners, funded us a huge amount of money, well above the 60. And then they went out of business in 2009 because they were such, you know, I mean, they were cowboys, right? Because, you know, the, they were investing in a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff correlated to the market. And when the market collapsed, we were one of the few, I think, good investments because we were a very uncorrelated business to the market. They were fantastic partners, great guys, better be lucky than good. So that's how we got started. You hear, where are they today? They're not in business. You speak with Joe or any of those guys? Actually, you know, once every once in a while, I do speak to, to Joe. Yeah. They, they, were, they were all former Drexel Burnham guys that worked for Michael Milken. Amazing. They, they, yeah, they were at, at their peak. They were, and they, they were only a, a couple of months old when they looked at my book. <laughs> so, and then they turned into a $5 billion hedge fund in a couple of years and then went out. Anyone else? Question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do um, a public? How does a publishing company hire songwriters? Well, we don't. We don't hire songwriters. We go and do deals with songwriters. So we do any one of a number of deals, right? So um, we like a songwriter, and a songwriter says, "You know what? I don't need any money. I don't need your money. I need your help." I want an administration deal, I want to own my own songs, but you administer. So for that, we probably wouldn't give them an advance. They would own their songs, we would work with them, and we would take a fee for working with them. We don't like to do that, because we don't own anything. But in cases of amazing writers, we'll do an administration deal. We just, did an, we just closed a deal yesterday with Accounting Crows, as an example. So you know, we administer them. They didn't want to sell. We're administering them. Most of the time, with new songwriters, we do what's called a co-publishing deal, where we'll give the writer an advance, we'll have a co-publishing agreement, we'll own 50% of their music publishing, they'll own 100% of their songwriter share and 50% of the publishing, and it's an advance, so if we're successful in helping them get on records and promoting the records and making money, we recoup our advance from their share of the writing royalties, and we co-own songs with them. Those are the deals we typically, typically do. They're great if you're successful, and they're not so good if the writer's unsuccessful. Thank you. So I just want to add that uh, I've been privileged to... Somebody, uh, somebody else? Was there somebody back there? Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You deal a lot with legacy acts. What are a couple that you would like to work with or acquire? Huh. Um, well, <laughs> you know, you probably, everyone you've heard of that's iconic, I'd like to work with and buy. I mean, pretty much. You know, we, uh, uh, we've got a lot of deals that we're working on. Um, that where, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, um, <laughs> you remember, uh, you, know, you guys are a lot younger than me. You remember Little House on the Prairie? And Bonanza? Yeah. And Highway to Heaven? So there's a songwriter 
uh, named David Rose. You would never have heard of David Rose. David Rose was a guy who wrote tons of incredible themes, cues, and orchestrations for great television shows, great movies. So we're in the process of buying that catalog. The one song that wasn't, you know, well, he's got a bunch of songs, but the most famous song that he has is called The Stripper Song. All right, so you remember, you know that old burlesque song? Dun, 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 dun. Yep. It's, it, yeah, so we're, that's one of the songs in the catalog that, that we think is dramatically under commercially oh. exploited. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, Little House on the Prairie, Bonanza, Highwood Heaven, those television shows are going to play around the world forever. Yep. So, you know, that gives you an idea. We'll, while the writer isn't iconic, uh, he is iconic as a writer, but you wouldn't have heard of him. Uh, the songs are iconic. So we want to buy iconic songs. We want to buy iconic artists. And if I could buy the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and you name it, we'd want to buy it. But I can't tell you what I'm working on. Any, anyone else? Probably work for a competing publishing company. <laughs> so, well, thank Larry for coming, but I just want to add that in all my years here, that this has been one of the more constructive, interesting conversations because the man has, unlike a lot of other executives at his level, he's, you know, peeling back and taking the curtain behind and you can see the guy pulling the instruments and, and he didn't need Toto the dog to, to do that. He's been very forthright in sharing his information and I really want to thank him for that because I think that gives you guys a perspective and some information that you wouldn't really get anywhere else. So I want to thank you for coming. Uh, so I do want to say just one more thing, which is that you guys are very lucky because uh, Steve and I used to work together. And I will tell you that there are very, very few people in the music business that are more honest, that are, more, that are nicer guys. And by the way, you know, it, it, even when, even before uh, we had success at Primary Wave, I would go up to the serious offices and Steve would say, hey, come up, let me introduce you around. Even today when he doesn't have to, he is such a good guy that, you know, I have artists that, that you know, some artists nobody really wants to meet with, nobody really wants to talk with. But I'll call Steve and I'll say, Steve, I really need you to do me a favor. I really need you to meet with this artist or introduce the artist around Sirius. And Steve is always yes. There is ne Steve has never said no. He is the nicest guy in the music business. And believe me, the music business is littered with guys that are not nice. Steve is incredible. So you guys are lucky to be. Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah.